about some of these things. So it's Acts 4.32 through 5.11. And today we're going to talk about lying to God. Um, the, uh, the key verse for this passage is, You have not lied to men, but to God. This is in Acts 5, 4b. Today we're going to meet Barnabas, but just in passing. And so we're going to talk a little bit about him. Barnabas is mentioned 25 times in the book of Acts. He's an important character. And um, as you see, he's one of the group of new believers. He's from the tribe of Levi, from the island of Cyprus. And I've given you some follow-up uh, some follow-up work if you'd like to. By the way, when I say look up this, look up that, take notes, you never have to do any of that. You know that, don't you? What we do is all voluntary. But I always want to give something added and something extra because we get out of Bible study what we put into it. We won't get any more than what we put into it. And so as we put more into it, we will get more out of it. So I'll always give you a little bit of extra there that you can look and you can find out a little bit more um, about it. You know, at Lighthouse, we teach and preach the Word of God. And some of you are new believers, you're coming in, but a lot of you, you're mature believers, you've studied the Word of God, and you are beyond the place where you have to get all of your spiritual food with a spoon from the pastors. As you dig for yourselves, the Holy Spirit teaches you and the Holy Spirit gives you spiritual food and that's really how we grow as well. Don't worry about them, they're getting some sound and some things. There we go, fixed up over here. Uh, so what was Barnabas's real name? That's not his real name. What's his real name? Most of us don't even know unless you look at the notes. His real name, his given name was Joseph and he was so known for his character and his, his Christian character and his personality as Barnabas, the son of encouragement, that that's all that we remember about Barnabas. We don't remember that his name was Joseph. But you're going to meet at the other end of the spectrum this morning, you're going to meet a married couple, Ananias and Sapphira. A lot of us are very familiar with Ananias and Sapphira. Some of us, this is a little bit new to us, a married couple that in some ways seem like Barnabas but actually are completely opposite what Barnabas is like in his character. This still takes place in Jerusalem. We know that it's still in the early days of the church. Look at the first. Uh, you're gonna, we're going to see two firsts today. We're going to see the first public judgment for sin. And in this passage in Acts 5.11, for the very first time, for the very first time in the book of Acts, Luke is going to call the believers who have gathered together, he's going to call them the church. That's kind of a big deal, isn't it? They're called the church. They've been called other things before this time, the congregation, the gathering, the fellowship, but for the first time they're going to be called the church. Ecclesia, the called out ones, called out of darkness, called out of the world, and called into God's family. So we're going to see that for the first time as well. We're going to look at one word kept or kept back in Acts 5.3 and we'll talk about that just a little bit later. And then at the bottom I give you some homework and a looking ahead. So um, you can keep your eyes on that but we're going to look if you want to you can flip over to the uh, you can flip over to the to the back side. I hope you have your pens with you this morning. Um, we've got some writing to do. As always there is no test and at the end, if you think, I didn't get the answer right, I missed part of it, you may come up here and I have written the correct answers in red. And you can come up here and check for, and check for yourself. So I will, um, I'll put that up here for you. But we turn to the Word of God this morning. And we don't want to shy away from this. Because you know sometimes we like, we like the, the, the good words of God, don't we? We like the Psalms. We like the happy parts. Um, we like uh, in Ephesians, we are seated in heavenly places with Christ. But this is part of the Word of God as well. And as you and I take every part of the Word of God, the hard parts and the easy parts, as we take them into our lives, then we receive a balanced diet. And that balanced diet helps us to grow and helps us to be strong. So we want to look this morning. That's one of the reasons, by the way, brothers and sisters, that, um, that we sometimes do, that I especially, I'll sometimes do book series with you. Let's go through the book. Let's, and, and I know some, sometimes people may think, oh, Pastor Jennifer, it's really long. And, and, you know, there are parts that aren't very inspiring. But all of it taken into our lives. And as we respond to it, it helps us to grow. So, Lord, this morning as we look at your word, we receive it as it is. It is your word. 
you inspired it by your Holy Spirit through the pen of Luke and you preserved it in its entirety for us all the way to today and even beyond should you tarry in your return. But Lord, we're your people gathered here this morning in your name. And so as we come to your word and feed on your word, may it bring strength to our lives, to our bodies. May it bring correction and direction according to the empowering of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Now, how does Act 4 end? I'm going to give you... I, Help me. We're going to be a quick. It's going to be a quick review because it's been a month or so since we've looked at the Book of Acts, right? Long time la. Okay. So Act Four. The Act Four. We had what? We had power. We had preaching. We had persecution, and then we had what? What's the last one? Prayer. Prayer. Okay. Let's look at the next slide. And uh, if you'll remember, we ended with this last time. Uh, a quote from Sam Samuel Chadwick, the great and a great early Methodist evangelist um, who always remember he always prayed for a Lazarus in all of his evangelistic campaigns and a Lazarus remember was always the worst one in the community the drunkard the 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 wife and family abuser the gambler the worst one and he always prayed for a for a Lazarus for God to raise up that Lazarus and then people's hearts were open and people were interested God still does that today and Samuel Chadwick a man of great prayer who's written several books about prayer. Um, the Path of Prayer is his most well-known one. If you like to read and you like Christian uh, classics, that's a great book for you to get. It's called The Path of Prayer by Samuel Chadwick. I don't know if it's in our library. It's in my library. Um, and, and if you're careful, I might let you borrow it. But Samuel Chadwick says, Sat said, Satan dreads nothing but prayer. His one concern is to keep the saints from praying. Let me ask you something. How hard is it for you to pray when you think you should? When it's time to pray? You'd rather do anything than pray, wouldn't you? Most of us. Everything comes in the way of prayer. May I tell you something this morning? That is true whether you are a beginning Christian or whether you are an old saint like me. Prayer is not easy, and I think it is not easy because the enemy knows how effective prayer can be in our lives and through our lives. The enemy knows better than we know, better than we know, how powerful and effective prayer destroys his work and his kingdom, and he will stop us if he can. Brothers and sisters, there is victory in prayer. There's victory in prayer in every area of, area of our lives. And, and it's sad to me that the devil knows that better than Christians know it, right? And so he says, he's one concern is to keep the saints from praying. He fears nothing from prayerless studies. Oh, I could study all day Friday, Saturday, Thursday, Wednesday to have a beautiful sermon for Sunday morning. But if I have not prayed, who cares? It, the word will go forth. It will be a true word. But there will be little power in that word to convict our lives and to cause us to respond to truth. So there must be prayer. He fears nothing from prayerless work. How many of us work for the Lord in a variety of ways? And we think, God, I'm doing this for you. I'm doing this for you. But even in the work for the Lord, the parts of the work for the Lord that are not even very, don't seem very spiritual perhaps, if prayer doesn't empower our work for the Lord, it's useless. It's useless. Listen, brothers and sisters, Buddhists can probably do more good deeds than Christians can, more selflessly more long-term, more whatever. Our difference is prayer. Our difference is prayer. He fears nothing from prayerless religion. He laughs at our toil. He mocks our wisdom, but he trembles when we pray, when we pray. And when we came to the end of Acts, the, the fourth act, of this Acts chapter 4, we came to this wonderful prayer meeting with these saints that were being persecuted by the Sanhedrin. They gather together and they pray. Let's look at the next slide. What type of prayer is going to strengthen us and make the enemy tremble? We see it all in those few verses. In Acts chapter 4, verses 29 through 31, we see it. What is the first type of prayer? Number one, prayer whose vision and sight is God 
not themselves or ourselves or our circumstances. How do they, be, how do they begin that prayer? Oh, sovereign Lord. And sovereign means the all-powerful one, the one who created everything. And when you and I, when our prayers are focused on the sovereign Lord, then we get our eyes off of how big our problems are, how great our difficulties, all the lack that we have, and our faith begins to grow. O Sovereign Lord is to the one who's in total control with absolute power. The Creator is greater than any part of His creation. Amen? Amen. And so, O Sovereign Lord. Secondly, what type of prayer? It is prayer that's full of Scripture. How do they pray? You spoke long ago by your servant David. If you will look at the prayers of the New Testament, especially as you go through the book of Acts, do you know what you will see about the prayers of the New Testament? You will see that they are prayers full of Scripture. Full of Scripture. And you know, you and I, I, I I'm only inspired by New Testament. Brothers and sisters, they didn't have the New Testament in New Testament times. They were the New Testament. And so all of their prayers, it was all Old Testament verses, all Old Testament truth, all Old Testament scripture. But by the infilling, empowering work of the Holy Spirit, what seems so dry and dusty to many of us, empowered their prayers and put juice in their prayers. It strengthened their prayers. The scripture in your prayer is the antidote to anemic, powerless prayers. Do your prayers sometimes feel anemic and powerless? Yes. Mine do. Yes. Yeah, me too. Me too. We kind of say the same thing over and over again. We sound so wimpy, don't we? Oh, God, help me. Now, there's nothing wrong with, oh, God, help me. But if my prayer is only, oh, God, help me, hey, God's got more than that for us in His Word. And as, as Scripture gets into our hearts... It comes out in our prayers. It's amazing to me. Think about it this way. If we look at these New Testament believers, New Testament believers had no individual copies of the Bible. How many of you, is there anyone here that doesn't have a Bible? You don't own a Bible? If you don't, come see me. I will give you a Bible at the end of the service. How many of you have more than five Bibles? Raise your hand. Look around. You have more than five Bibles. Yeah, thank you, Miss Penny, Miss Melis. How many of you have more than ten Bibles? No. I, I, I know. <laughs> uh, sorry, including the U version on your phones. Inclu ah, now let me go back and ask that question again. <laughs> All of us, many. What what to me is interesting is this, and I'm not trying to laugh or make fun, but I do I do think this. You and I in the 21st century, we have more access to the Word of God and Scripture than any generation that has come before us. A as we're going to go to this inspired exhibit at St. Andrews and we're going to see the Gutenberg Press. Um, that's, that is the first printing press that, I remember this from my studies before in university, the first printing press that was able, that could mass produce the Word of God. And then, and, and then, instead of with just a, a treasured few, a, a, an, a, an anointed few, it was available to many. You and I live in a time when we have more access than anyone has ever had in ages before us. And yet, I am sad to say that we probably know less of the Bible, we have less of the Bible in our lives and in our hearts than any earlier generation. Is that probably is that not true it, it's likely isn't it it's likely so it's amazing to me these early believers no individual copies of the Bible but you can see it when they pray and when they talk God's Word has saturated their lives and it saturates their prayers and they were powerful and mighty in the name of God so I want to challenge you I want to encourage you to really get God's Word in your heart and in your lives and may I say something to those of you especially if you are a little bit younger you know, I'm one of the older ones now at Lighthouse. I, unfortunately, I really am. While you are younger and your brains have less in them, hide God's Word in your heart and turn off your cell phones, please. So, but get, get God's Word in your heart and in your life. The scriptures that I memorized when I was four years old and five years old, honestly, that my parents, that my mother, those of you who are mothers, that my mother helped me to memorize, I am now almost, as you know, 60 in a few years, a few short years. 
I remember every single one of those scriptures in the King James. Not because I'm so great, but God has made our brains in a wonderful way. And when we hide God's Word in our hearts, oh, it does things in our lives and in our prayers. What's the next thing that makes prayer that strengthens us and makes the enemy tremble? Submissive prayer. They pray, oh, they talk about Jesus and all of that, and then they pray, it was according to your will, oh God. And brothers and sisters, when our prayer includes the understanding, God, whatever I face, it has not touched me except that it came through you first. When you and I can accept that, when you and I can take that into our hearts and lives and that comes out in our prayers, we will make it. Does it mean that God sent the bad thing that has happened to you? Of course not. God is a good God. He loves us. But we live in a broken and a fallen world. And your God, your Father who loves you, He loves you. Nothing touches you except it has come through Him first. And you can rest in that. And when you feel like, I am not going to make it, God, this is too hard. Lord, this is too much. You run to Him because it has gone through Jesus first. And He will keep you. He will keep you. And finally, what type of prayer that strengthens us and makes the enemy tremble? It is a prayer that comes from your heart when you are determined, as the disciples were, God, I am determined to honor you no matter what the results. I think sometimes our prayers fall short because our prayers are more about God, make it easier for me. God, make it better for me. God, take care of problems so I, my life can be comfortable and I can have this and I can have that. And there is nothing wrong with praying for ease. There's nothing wrong with praying for comfort. There's nothing wrong with praying for any of these things. That's right. That's part of it. It's included in God's Word. But always let your higher prayer be the prayer that Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane that night as He prepared to go to the cross for you and for me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Let that be our prayer. We de determine to honor God no matter the results. And if you will determine to honor God, God will strengthen you. You will make it. I'll make it. We will get through. We will get through. And He will take care of all of these things. So this prayer, the prayer that they prayed, it's prayer for us as well. Amen? And I told you I was going to keep this part short, but we, we came through this part so quickly about a month ago, I wanted us to come back to, the, to this part again because prayer is the life. The prayer through the Holy Spirit, it's the life and it's the power and the force of the New Testament church. And what worked for them works for us. Amen? It works for us this morning. So this is what we see. They pray this. The supernatural response from God is a shaking of the place, whether it was a literal shaking of, of we don't know, the Bible doesn't tell us, um, outside or it was just inside. Remember I told you one time in China I experienced that kind of amazing. Um, be sure to check your phones. And it, it shook and they understood God has heard us and God will answer. Now, let's see what comes next. Next slide. So here we come to the dramatic story of Ananias and Sapphira, but I want to give you a bigger overview for just a minute, okay? If you go all the way back, even before this, in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit is poured out. Okay, stay with me. Let's take a big view just a minute. As you can see in the notes, even before the notes. So I'm going to talk about this at the top. The Holy Spirit's poured out. And then remember the end of Acts chapter 2? They gathered together. Remember the four things? They devoted themselves to the apostles' doctrine, to fellowship, to, uh, to meeting together, breaking bread, and to prayer. So those things, and God was bringing them together, and there was unity. And then the story of the healing of the lame beggar. And then... We come at the end of the story, this prayer, after this prayer, the meeting place shook, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and then what happened? 
They preached the word of God with boldness. This was their highest prayer. It was not primarily, oh God, keep us from being persecuted for your sake. It was, oh God, help us to do what you called us to do before you went back to heaven. Then they preached the word of God with boldness. Now, uh, click, and then if you skip, right here is the parenthesis of the story of Barnabas, Ananias, and Sapphira, okay? So there's the parenthesis, but take out the parenthesis and we're sort of skipping as you would skip stones across a lake. We go from here to here, and actually these two parts fit together. So take a look at that at just a minute. Here's the prayer. We've talked about that before. And then, we're not going to get this far this morning, but take a look here. And I've given you just parts of it. Acts 5, 12 through 16, after Ananias and Sapphira. The apostles were performing many miraculous signs and wonders among the people. More and more people believed were brought to the Lord. Crowds of both men and women. Crowds came from the villages around Jer Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those possessed by evil spirits, and they were all healed. They were all healed. And there's more there that we'll get into next week. Some dramatic things that we haven't looked at. Next week we're going to look at um, people. God's power is so strongly on Peter that they take people who are sick, put them out in the street so that as Peter walks, his shadow would fall upon them and they would be healed. Amazing. Amazing. That's next week. Really amazing. Amazing. God was doing something special. But I don't, do you see the connection here? Here's the prayer. Here's the answer. Do you see that? We see that together. It's a perfect combination. So make sure these two, when you're looking at it, these two, they go together. They go together. So as we look at this, here is the big picture. And as we look at this, what we see is that God is growing His church and he's developing his family. This is God's church. You can take a minute, yeah, just to look at that. And I want us to keep in mind, as we look, as we read through Acts, you and I forget, here we are, 21st century, you and I forget sometimes, brothers and sisters, the church is God's church. It is not people who say, I'm going to make church this way. It is God who says, this is my church, and this is how I'm going to build my church. My church is built in this way. My church is going to look like this. I have given Jesus for this church, a church without blemish or spot or wrinkle. This is how my church is going to be built. My church is going to be like me. It, the, my church is going to have my heart. And so God was building his church. And that's important for us to remember as we look at the story of Ananias and Sapphira this morning. It will help us understand a hard, hard story. Okay, so let's look at the next Acts 44, uh, 32 through 35. Here is, here is, and if you want to look, uh, you, can, if you, you can do this while we're talking if you want to. If you want to circle some things in your notes, I'll say circle or underline the nature and the spirit of the new believers and their fellowship. Or you can do that later and just listen if you want to. But I want you to take a minute and look at this snapshot of the church as we come into Barnabas, Ananias, and Sapphira. What do we see here? God is growing His church and developing a family. Brothers and sisters, this is what God does when He builds His church. Here in Lighthouse, whether or not we are like this, it is God's plan for us to be like this. It is God's goal for us to be like this. It is God's purpose for us to be like this. It is not just, it's Sunday morning, so I'll go to church at Lighthouse today. I feel comfortable there, so why don't I get together with other people? My friends are there, so I'll go there too. Church is so much more than that. It is God's construction. It is God's plan. It is God's design. And he, people are hearing the gospel. They repent. They believe the Holy Spirit baptizes them into the family of God, not water baptism, which we're going to have May 1st, but baptizes them. The other, other scriptures say it's the Holy Spirit who brings you into the family of God. You didn't do that by yourself. The Holy Spirit brings you into the family of God. That's the only way to get into the family of God. You can't get in because your friends get in. You can't get in because you say, let me sign a membership pledge and give my tithes. Now I'm part of the church. You can be part of people's church, but you're not part of God's church until the Holy Spirit baptizes you into the church. 
So they come into the church and look with me. They were united in heart and mind. Ignore it and whoever does it, take care of it. Okay. The believers were united in heart and mind and they felt that what they had was, what they owned was not their own. Now here we start seeing some keys for the church. They were united in heart and mind. I love this because this is not an artificial unity. Have you ever been part of something that's artificial in unity? Let's not say anything. Okay, I don't want to offend anybody, so let me be really nice. I don't like them very much, but I'm, just, I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> this is not what this is talking about. These people were pretty different. But because God, the Holy Spirit, worked in their hearts, He changed their hearts, and what came out of their hearts and their minds, it was a unity, and it was God's heart. It was people looking at other people and saying, what I have is not my own. You're part of my family. You're part of the body of Christ together. We are in this together. We're not in this alone. We're in this together. And as we look at this, I want to, this is not even in my notes, but as I was praying, as I was sitting there, and as, as we were singing earlier, I, I felt the Holy Spirit just reminding me of this and, and speaking this to my heart as we look at this passage. Here, the apostles are testifying powerfully. They're doing what God has said to do. God's great blessing was upon them all. Do you see that? Not just the apostles. God's blessing was upon everybody. Look at verses 34 and 35. There were no needy people among them because those whose owned lands or houses would sell them, bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. So here we have this picture. We're going to talk about this in just a minute. But here is where I want to challenge us as a church this morning. This picture that we see here for sure it wasn't perfect. People were still imperfect. People still had shortcomings and problems. There were people in the church of God who were short-tempered. There were people in the church of God who were prideful. There were people in the church of God who were shy or who talked too much or whatever or who were prickly and rubbed people the wrong way as there is in every church, right? as there is in every church. But God the Holy Spirit was working on them. And here's the beauty of what we see God doing. God was making them into one body. And what you see here is what I think is so lacking in many churches today. As a pastor, it grieves me. Please don't get offended. I'm speaking in love to you this morning. It grieves me when I see people who zip in and who zip out of church and never make connections and share lives and share their lives with others. And I say that because it grieves me because that's not God's plan for us. We go through a, t we're in a tough world, brothers and sisters. This is a, if you're having an easy time of it right now, praise the Lord, but that's not usually how it is. Things are tough at times. We go through health concerns. We go through financial concerns. We go through times of grief when our hearts are broken. Times of despair. Christians battle with depression. Really? Clinical depression? All these, all these things. And when we zip in and when we zip out and when we don't share our lives with the family of God we fall short. We, we, we won't be healthy. We can't, we can't receive what we need to receive in the family of God. The other part of that is I see people, and, I, and in Lighthouse it's like that as well. There are people at times, for whatever reason, there are those of us that we come to the church, we come to church, we're connected to God, and we're connected to the pastor, but we're not connected to anybody else in the church. And may I say something to you this morning? That ain't good enough. <laughs> it's, it's not good enough. Do you know why? Because as your pastor, and Pastor Renee as your pastor or as the leaders, we don't have enough, even with God's inspiration, we don't have enough in us to meet all your needs. We really don't. Even when we are full of the Holy Spirit and full of the power of God, we don't have enough. We can't help you in all the ways that you need to be helped. Do you know why? Is it because we're imperfect and poor and bad? No. It's because God has designed us as a church and as a body to minister together, to fellowship together, to share together, to love together. And I know sometimes it's hard to share tough things in our lives. So be careful how you share. This should be a place of love and protection in the church. But if you're going through things in your heart, in your life, that are tough and hard, 
you should be sharing with others. And people should be helping to carry your burdens. That is God's plan for a healthy church. Amen, brothers and sisters. Amen. Amen. I, I always, when somebody talks with me or says, Pastor Jennifer, can I talk with you? Of course, I'm happy to talk with you. I'm, I'm happy to. And God gives gifts to the church in the pastor and others for the church's benefit. But God's plan is that there is a sharing together and a caring together. And that's the pattern that we see in the church. Does that make sense to us all this morning? I hope I didn't offend anybody. I hope I didn't disappoint you. But I will tell you this. If you are only counting on me and Pastor Renee, I promise you we will disappoint you. I promise you we will disappoint you. Because God hasn't given us all that is needed for the health of every single person in the church. It comes in the fellowship. And that's what we, that's what we, we see there. Amen. So they begin to, they're, they're together, they're in unity. God, it, why are they like this? Because the Holy Spirit of God is reproducing His likeness in His family. Does that make sense? He's reproducing his likeness. Those of you that have children, uh, when I, I, you know, I look at pictures of, uh, may I use Kim, uh, Kim and May as an example. Um, I look at little pictures of, of, uh, of Gloria and Sam, and then I look at baby pictures of Kim and May, and I just laugh out loud because it's a perfect, I mean, you might as well say, that's Kim. That's May, pretty much. There's such a family resemblance. And that's the physical, but brothers and sisters, the same thing is true spiritually. God's DNA in us reproduces His likeness in us. Amen. And that's what we see in the church. So, as God is doing this, what happens next? Let's look at the next passage. It goes a little bit further. And we see, what do we... Uh, 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 I think I've done the wrong. Do I have Acts 2, 43 through 46? Michelle, go back just a minute. Yeah, back up just, I didn't include it, did I? Never mind, it's in my notes. You see, I told you I'd disappoint you. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I don't have it in my notes. Michelle, it's in my notes, it's, it's not there. Um, but if you want to, go back and look at chapter 2, not right now, chapter 2 verses 43 through 46 and compare these two passages and you'll see the same thing again um, this 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 work that God is doing now because of the deep prejudice of the Jews because of the deep prejudice of the Jews against people who started following Jesus or they became followers of the way those Jews who became Christians and in these early early times it was it was all it was all Jewish the the church in the beginning was a Jewish church and because of the deep prejudice of Jews against early Christians what happened when they converted to Christianity many of them lost their jobs many of them lost means of employment many of them if they were in their families they were kicked out of their homes and they were rejected by their families. That happened to my grandmother and my grandfather in the early 20s when my grandparents, my mother's parents, were baptized in the Holy Spirit. They were, their background was Amish, and I've told you about them before. They were kicked out of the Amish community and they were shunned. And for 25 years, no one from their family spoke to them. 25 years. Mothers, fathers, aunts, uncles. No one spoke to them in their family. And then God began to work. So what we're looking at and what we're talking about this morning is not unusual. Do you know, brothers and sisters, for you and for me, as we have become Christians, for many of us, we have had the easy way, not the hard way. We've had the easy way. In many cultures and in many societies, even today, when people become Christians, where Christianity is not the main cultural a component of religion that still happens to people today when I grew up in Singapore that happened to a young Muslim boy named Sammy and I've told you a little bit about his story before and his family beat him up and fam and finally his family kidnapped him and sent him out to an island so that he would give up this Christianity there were young people in the church who be who became Christians and it was sort of okay until they made the decision to, I am going to be baptized. I'm going to be baptized. And when they made the decision to be baptized, that was a big deal. Um, Ian and his mom here, 
if they're both from Singapore, to talk about Singapore in that way now sounds so unusual because in Singapore, if you're a Christian, hey, that's kind of great, right? But that's not how it was. Some of you, Filipinos or others, from your background, when you became a Christian, you accepted persecution and rejection by your family. Some of you who are Chinese, it's been difficult with your Chinese families, your parents, as you have become Christians. And so, as we look at Ananias and Sapphira and the early church, this is what happened. And as they were kicked out of their homes, there was no government or benevolent society to help. Um, as there is today, you know, you can get government aid if you lose your work, there's food for you, there's this and there's that. There were none of those things at that time. And so the early church in Jerusalem had quite a lot of poverty. There, there was quite a lot of poverty. How was God, how are they going to meet the needs of the poor in the church? God who is a generous God and loves his people, was going to meet the needs of the church, but he was going to use people to meet the needs. Brothers and sisters, this is why the New Testament today still says it is not true religion when you say to a brother or sister who is hungry or cold, be happy, be blessed, be blessed, go in God's peace when they're hungry or cold, and you and I have the means to help. That's not true Christianity. That's not true religion. And it is God's plan. It is God's plan that needs within the body of Christ. Yes, there's government aid and there's government help. And I'm preaching about something very specific. But it is still God's plan to use God's people to meet the needs of God's people along with other things. It, it really is. But part, and it's not, may I say something else? It's not just the financial. It, financial is what we're talking about here. But there are other needs, aren't there? Yes. There are other needs as well. If somebody in Lighthouse is depressed and crying and grieving and all of this and that, is there government or medical help available? Yes, there is. But when you and I are connected in the family of God, we bear one another's burdens in this way by loving, by supporting, by encouraging, by praying and saying, are you doing okay? You've been on my heart. You've been on my mind. I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. This is what it means to be in the family of God. Amen? Amen. Does that make sense to us? It does. This is God's plan, brothers and sisters. And when, when we function this way, this is what makes a healthy church. So it is in this situation that we meet Barnabas. Okay? So, for instance, there was Joseph. Joseph, who's Joseph? Barnabas. There you go. For instance, there was Joseph, the one the apostles nicknamed Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. May I, give, may I mention something to you here? This expression here, encouragement, is the same word that is used for the Holy Spirit. The paraclesis, the one who comes along beside and walks with and supports and strengthens and encourages and comforts. That's, that's what that word means. What a beautiful nickname. Don't you wish you had that nickname? You know, I'll never have a son now. It's way too late. But I think I might have to name one Barnabas. That's a great... We, we probably wouldn't do that. That's kind of an old-fashioned name these days, isn't it? But those of you that are thinking about... You might think about it. Barnabas. Okay. You can call him Barney for short. <laughs> but he's a, he's a purple dinosaur, isn't he? <laughs> Forget it. <laughs> but what a great name, isn't it? May I ask you something this morning, and may I challenge you with, with something this morning? If you were given a nickname in the family of God, what would it be? Honestly, no joke. What would it be? Would you be called Barnabas? Or would you be called, don't get hurt, but I'm going to say some things. Would you be called uh, Prickly Pear or Cactus? <laughs> Honestly, I love you, but you know, sometimes we get kind of prickly, don't we? Be careful. Step carefully around this brother or this sister, right? Isn't that a shame? Or, or Debbie Downer or something like that or, 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 or whatever. Or Jiao Ao, John, or something like that. Those of you that say, what? That's Proud John, <laughs> okay? Or something like that. What would your nickname be? May I say something to you this morning? If you don't have a very, we can be honest, and I can encourage you, 
go to somebody who's really a good friend, who loves you, who loves you. Not somebody who's going to, but somebody who loves you. And say, honestly, if you really mean it, what would my name be? And may I say something to you this morning? And we, we know ourselves quite well at times also. If it's a name that you don't like very much, guess what? You can change it. I can change it. Because the Spirit of God is at work in us. Oh my goodness. Some of you think I've got problems now as your pastor. May I say something to you? You should have known me when I was 23, 24, and 25. You wouldn't have wanted, you wouldn't have wanted to be my friend. But praise the Lord, He's still working on me. And He hasn't stopped working on me. And the same is true for, for each one of us. Amen? Amen? And this comes, again, I go back to this, this comes again in the relationship, not only with God, not only with God, brothers and sisters, but in the relationship with our brothers and our sisters. Amen? Really, this is God's functioning. This is God's plan. And so we meet Barnabas. And later on, we're going to really find out about Barnabas. He's called the son of encouragement. And later on, Barnabas is going to be someone who encourages a young man named Saul, who, whom we know as Paul. And later on, when Paul, who could never have been nicknamed son of encouragement, that's not his nickname. He's got other nicknames, but not that one. When Paul gives up on another young man named John Mark and says, you're not suitable for ministry. <laughs> Barnabas, the son of encouragement, takes that young man, John Mark, under his wings and encourages him. And so John Mark makes it. And then we read more about John Mark later. What what a person we, we can look up to and be inspired by. You know, we look at Paul, we look at Peter, and we look at some of these others. Brothers and sisters, there are simple, quiet people and Christians like Barnabas that are mighty men and women of God in God's church and in God's family. He's made them in that way, and they've walked into what God has called them to be. And so we meet Barnabas. Um, and we're not going to get all the way through, but we'll, we'll keep this pa page for next week and we're going to close it in just a couple of minutes. But let me give you a bridge as we look at what's going to come ahead to think as we, as we come to an end this morning. <laughs> Barnabas sells a field that he has. He was a Levite, and Levites actually weren't supposed to have land, according to Old Testament, but maybe that was no longer in practice. But anyhow, Barnabas sells a field. We don't know if the field was in Palestine or if it was on Cyprus. We don't know. And he takes it, and he brings the money from the sale, and he lays it at the feet of the apostles. Now... How many of you, you have seen something on television or may, maybe you've been in a service before while the preacher was preaching and then people get inspired and they come running down to the front with money. DJ's looking at me and he's going like that. And maybe it's more common in, in the U.S. and in other places. And they give it to the preacher or the evangelist or they lay it at the feet. This is not what this is talking about, brothers and sisters. This is not what this is talking about. It is done publicly. And we may say, publicly? Why publicly? Jesus said, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. So what's this about? Was Barnabas trying to get public praise for doing something? No. But remember, this is the early church. There are no deacons yet. There are no uh, there's no, there are no money counters like we have at Lighthouse. There's no deacon board to handle the finances. Who handled the finances in the early church in the beginning? The apostles did. The apostles did. And what Barnabas does is done publicly, so it is seen publicly. It's not a private gift to the apostles. And then it is handled publicly as well. And that was a good thing. It kept there from being, I put the money in my pocket, or this or that. And obviously, the Lord approves of how it was done. Obviously, the Lord approves because what Barnabas does and the results encourage others. It is not, the giving was not to everybody notice me, everybody, oh, look what a great Christian I am. Barnabas, in his life, paid the price as a Christian in discipline, in sacrifice, and in giving 
to be where he was as a Christian. Ananias and Sapphira did not. They saw Barnabas, that's why Barnabas is here, and then Ananias and Sapphira. Maybe they looked at Barnabas and thought, wow, look, everybody respects Barnabas so much. They've called him, he's good friends with the apostles. They're calling him Barnabas instead of Joseph. I want that. And what happened, the difference was Barnabas's gift and generosity and sacrifice was motivated by the heart of God, which is a heart of love and generosity and unity. We're all in this together. And the heart of Ananias and Sapphira, it was motivated by, I want what he has in standing and honor, but I don't want to pay the price. I want that but I want to keep my money in my pocket. And brothers and sisters, in the family of God, in the family of God, and we close with this this morning, what you see in others, let me just step outside of yourself for a minute, what you see in others, in their Christian lives, in their Christian standing, and you look at that, and I look at that, and I long for that. Do you long for that sometimes? You think, wow, this is where they are in God. This is their standing. Guess what? They've paid a price for it. And everything we have and everything we are in God's church as Christians will come only as we pay a personal price for it in time spent on our knees in a discipline of self, in a correcting of self with the help of the Holy Spirit, in holy living, in prayer, in sacrifice and generosity. Those are the things that people don't see. You got that? Those are the things that people don't see. What people see is this life that is a life a giant life in God. And that's what Barnabas was in the church. And that's what Ananias and Sapphira wanted, but didn't want to pay the price for. And so this morning, as we close, I just want to challenge you. I don't know about you, but that last ending, part way through, it scares me just a little bit. It scares me just a little bit. I want to be willing to pay the price to be a Barnabas in God's church. Oh, God help us. We don't want to be Ananias and Sapphira, do we? We want to be what we are, don't we? And pay the price to move on in God. Let's close in prayer this morning. Lord, we come to you this morning as we come to these, the endings of, these, of, of this passage here. And Lord, one day we're going to meet Barnabas in heaven. We know it. We know it. But Lord, even now, we are so encouraged by this brother who lived a life of generosity and sacrifice and encouragement and received the honor and the praise that was, that was due. Lord, we want to be Barnabas in unselfishness and generosity. Oh God, help each one of us that we would kill that in us and put to death what is in each one of us that is like Ananias and Sapphira when we want to show something we are not. We want, when we want to be something we've not yet paid the price for, when we want others to esteem us and honor us as this and that, when, Lord, our lives all week long have been nothing like that. But, Lord, you don't condemn. You draw us on. And so, God, this morning, I pray, speak to our hearts by your Holy Spirit and help us to walk on in you. Lord, help us if we don't like the nickname we have in your family to work with your Holy Spirit and gain a new one in you. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you brothers and sisters.